Because you know that this ship carries a cargo of Escape, designed to feel from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, at your request, we bring back one of our most popular escape stories. We escape to a harbor front in Venezuela, and a grim voyage which started from there. As told by Martin Storm in his gripping tale, A Shipment of Mute Fate. I stopped on the wharf at LaGuara, picked up the gangplank toward the liner Chan K, standing there quiet at the moorings. The day was warm under a bright tropic sun. The harbor beyond the ship lay drowsy and silent. But all at once, in the midst of those peaceful surroundings, a cold chill gripped me, and I shivered with sudden dread. Dread of the thing I was doing and was about to do. But too much had happened to turn back now. I'd gone too far to stop. I set the box down on the edge of the wharf, placed it carefully so as to be in plain sight, and within gunshot of the captain's bridge. I knew what I was going to do, but I couldn't forget that a certain pair of beady eyes were watching every move I made. Eyes that never blinked and never closed, just watched and waited. I turned and started up the gangplank. Oh! Oh! You startled me, sir. Why, it's Mr. Warner. <laughs> Hello, Mother Willis. How's the best-looking stewardess on the seven seas? Why, I'm fine, Mr. Warner. I, I guess I'd better run along now. Get on with my chow. Oh, now, wait a minute. That's a fine greeting after two months. It's just that I'm so busy. <laughs> I don't believe a word of it. Sailing day's tomorrow. You're simply avoiding me, that's all. Oh, no, really, I'm not. And on the trip down from New York, you said I was your favorite passenger. But I'm only... Here, here. What, what's that you're carrying in your apron? Oh, what's well, nothing. Just, just supplies. Supplies? Let's have a look. No, please. <laughs> it's a cat. It's Clara, Mr. Warner. Mr. Bowman said I had to leave her a shower, and I just couldn't. Who's Mr. Bowman? The new second mate. Clara's been aboard with me for two years, and I just can't leave her here in a foreign country, especially with with her condition so delicate and all. Uh, yes, <clears throat> I see. Well, I hope you get away with it. Yes. You won't tell anyone. Not a soul. As a matter of fact, if things don't work out right, we may both end up smuggling. <laughs> have your boat on the trip down two months ago, Christopher, and I'm very glad you're coming along with us on the run back to New York. Well, thanks, Captain Wood. Uh, there is one thing, though. I'm having a little trouble with the customs men here, and I wonder... I to... can't do it, Christopher. I just cabled your father this morning. Told him I'd have done it for you if I possibly could. Uh, he sent a request from New York, you know. Yeah, I thought he would. I wired him from upriver last week. I hated to refuse, but it's absolutely out of the question. Captain Wood, I'm afraid I don't follow you. Responsibility to the passengers, son. We'll have women and children aboard. Not the liner, the safety of the passengers comes ahead of anything else. But with proper precaution... Something might happen. What? I don't know what, but something might. Carried worse things. There isn't anything worse. Any skipper afloat will bear me out. No, Christopher, I simply can't take the chance. I'm final. Final. It wasn't final if I could do anything about it. I hadn't come down here to spend two months in that stinking backcountry and then be stopped on the edge of the wharf. Two months of it. Heat, rain, insects, malaria. I'd gone clear in past the headwaters of the Orinoco. Traveled through country where every step along the jungle trail might be the last. Sanchez! Sitting in the wonder. Better start looking for a place to camp. Be dark in a little while. Si, senor. Very soon we turn to red. Camp on rocks by water. This is a very bad country. This is a very bad country. We've been saying that for ten days now. Very bad country. See, si, Senor Warner, this is a very bad country. Now, nah, skip it. For all the we've had so far, it might as well be Central Park. Uh, Central uh, Park? Uh, I don't understand. Never mind. Wait, you... Yeah, what's the matter? Quiet now! Sancho, what's wrong? They're in the past. See? Bushmaster. Bushmaster. 
deadliest snake in the world. Bushmaster. His Latin name was Lacasus Muta. Mute fate. It lay there in the center of the path, a ten-foot length of silent death, coiled loosely in an undulant loop, ready to strike violently at the least movement. Here was the one snake that would go after any animal that walked, or any man that lay there and watched us, not moving, not afraid, ready for anything. The splotch of its color stood out like some horrible gaudy floor mat lying there on the brown background of the jungle, waiting for someone to step on it. Here was what I'd come 2,000 miles for, Bushmaster. The natives captured the snake and Sanchez brought it to me in a rubber bag. He was shaking so hard I thought for a moment the thing had struck him. One thing you make sure, Senor Juan, not turn him loose in Venezuela. Because he know I the one who catch him. And he know where I live. All right, Sanchez, I'll keep an eye on him. He also know you pay me to catch him. All the time he watch and wait. You no forget that, Senor Warner, because he no forget. Not ever. Well, after going through all that trouble and danger and laying out 1,500 bucks, I wasn't going to let a pig-headed ship captain stop me at the last minute. At least not as long as the cables were still in operation between LaGuardia and New York. Good morning, Captain Wood. The boy at the hotel said you wanted to see me. That's right, Christopher. Sit down. Thanks. Seems you went with a great medicine where we left him yesterday. I'm sorry to go your head, Captain Wood, but I had to. The museum sent me a long way to get that snake. I'm not going to stop by red tape. It'll be the only live Bushmaster ever brought to the United States. Uh, yes, and if I had my way. But... Orders are orders. Got a cable from the head office this morning. All right, Christopher, suppose we talk about precautions. I'll handle it any way you say. You've got to have a stronger box. That crate's too flimsy. Well, it's stronger than it looks. A wire screen on top would hold a wildcat. Mm. But anyway, I bought a heavy sea chest this morning. We'll put the crate inside of it. Mm. Sounds all right. You've got a lock on it. Yeah, a heavy padlock. It's fixed so the lid can be propped open a crack without unlocking it. Snake's got to have air. In dirty weather, that lid has to stay shut. I'll take no chances. Fair enough. We'll keep the thing in my inside cabin where I sleep. You can't have it in the baggage room. And nobody on board is to know about it. Whatever you say, Captain. We won't have any trouble after all. It's only an animal that doesn't have any magical powers. I saw a Bushmaster in the zoo at Caracas once. They had it in a glass cage with double walls. It never moved. Just lay there and looked at you as long as you were in sight. Enough to give a man the creeps. I didn't know they had a Bushmaster at the Caracas Zoo. They don't now. They found the glass broken one morning and the snake gone, the night watchman dead. They never learned exactly what happened. Well, the watchman must have broken the glass by accident some way. The way they figured it, the glass was broken from the inside. Uh, we uh, sail in four hours. End of the Caribbean with perfect weather and a sea as smooth as an inland lake. The barometer dropped a little on the third day, but cleared up overnight, left nothing worse than a heavy swell. But in spite of the calm seas and pleasant weather, I found myself feeling more and more often a, an ominous foreboding. I was developing an almost unnatural fear of that snake. I stayed clear of the passengers pretty much, got the habit of dropping into Captain Wood's quarters several times a day. I kept the heavy box underneath his berth. I approached it quietly and shined my flashlight through the open crack. Never once could I catch that 12-foot devil asleep, or even excited. He'd be lying there half-coiled, his head raised a little, staring out of those beady black eyes, waiting. He'd still be like that when I turned away to leave. Maybe that's what bothered me, that horrible and constant watchful waiting. In the name of heaven was he waiting for? Well, huh? hello there, Mr. Warner. Oh, <laughs> how are you, Mother Willis? My, but you and the captain spend an awful lot of time around this cabin. I'm beginning to think the two of you must have some guilty secret. <laughs> no, 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 nothing like that, Mother Willis. I, I don't know about Captain Wood, but I certainly don't have any guilty secret. Running quite a swell out there, Mr. Bowman. Yeah, it's a little heavy, all right, Mr. Warner. Just a storm passed through to the west of us yesterday when the glass dropped. You think it missed us then, huh? Yeah, that's what the mate figures. Sure stirred up some water, though. 
This will put half the passengers in that bunk. They'll keep Mother Willis so busy. She... Hey, look at the size of that wave. Huh? Great sea hot that we're going to take it on the port bow. Hang on. That was a freak if there ever was one. Not enough to wave that size and strike. Oh, you see him like that sometimes, even in a conte. I got to get below, Mr. Warner. That water probably did some real damage in the officer's deck. Yeah, it's... What did you say? The wheel companionway was open on the port side. The British cabins must have taken a pretty bad smashing up. They're right below the... Something wrong, Mr. Warner? No. No, nothing at all, Mr. Bowman. At least I hope not. I didn't stop to find Captain Wood. Of course, I know it was only one chance in a thousand, but the chances against that freak wave were one in a thousand, too. I stumbled down the companionway and along the passage to the captain's cabin. Oh, come in, Mr. Walner. Mother Willis. My, is this cabin a mess? Trying to get some of these things out to dry. Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to... Ch- Where's that box that was under the captain's bunk? Oh, that? Well, I just threw it out on the deck. What? Oh, the desk over there slid into it. It was all smashed. But the small box inside of it, what happened to it? Oh, they were both splintered, Mr. Warner. Broke wide open. Oh, oh Mr. Warner, you're white as a sheep. Mother Willis, go find Captain Wood. Tell him to come down here immediately. Well, of course, Mr. Warner. I'll go tell him right away. I can finish up here later. I pulled open the top drawer of the bureau inside took out the captain's flashlight and loaded it. Mother Willis had left a mop stand by the door. I put my foot on the head of it and snapped off the handle. Every move I made turned into slow motion. I could hear my own heart beat. Slowly, I started to search the cabin. Sodden heaps of clothing and furnishings were scattered around on the wet black floor. I punched at them one at a time, holding the gun cocked, flashlight pointing along the stick. Nothing. I worked around the room, throwing the light into the dark corners, back of the desk, under the bunk. Wherever I turned, I could feel those cold, unblinking eyes at my back, watching, waiting. Using the stick, I pushed open the closet door and threw the light inside. Carefully, I poked at the boxes and junk on the floor. Snake was not in the closet. Inch by inch, I covered the entire cabin. And only then, a horrible realization began to dawn on me. Captain Wood. Mother Willis just told me. Hello, Christopher. It's happened. That's right, it's happened. So you found the gun. we better start searching the cabin here. Captain Wood, I just finished searching it. Oh, then. Women, kids, and that thing loose on board. A thousand places for us to hide. Heaven help us, Christopher. I know you're starting to blame anybody now, gentlemen. I didn't call you in here to pass judgment. The thing's done, and that's that. Well, you're right, Blake. What we have got to do is to pick up our minds how we're going to handle it. And it'd be easier if we didn't have to tell the passengers and crew. I've seen panic the board liners before. Yes, I agree with you, Mr. Bowman. But I don't quite see how we can avoid it. They've got a right to know. As long as that snake's loose, everybody on board's in the same danger. And they all ought to know about it. Captain Wood, that thing is 12 feet long. It can't simply crawl into a crack. Why don't we make a quick search of the whole ship before we spread any alarms? I've thought of that, Christopher. Uh, as far as I can see, the only place it couldn't be is in the boilers or on top of the galley stove. Well, it might have crawled overboard. We can't count on that. We've got to assume it's on the ship somewhere. Yeah, and that could be anywhere. In a coil of rope on a deck chair. A fire bucket or in a pile of clothes. Yes, yeah. or under some woman's berth or a baby's crib. Oh, You've really? already said it. I wish it could be anywhere. We've got to do something. We've got to do it fast. All right. I think the best idea is to follow Mr. Warner's suggestion and make a quick search first. Do you agree to that? Right. right. And if we don't find it, we'll have to warn the passengers. We've got to find it. Alone in the dim baggage room, I went through the same movements as I had earlier in the captain's cabin. Gun in one hand, flashlight in the other, poking into every dark corner, behind every trunk and box. Since the baggage room was empty, I could keep the gun cocked and ready. The rest of those poor devils were having to do the same thing, barehanded. All over the ship, the search went on. Here now, Stuart, what on earth are you doing rummaging through my cabin? Just checking up, ma'am. Well, I'm quite sure there's nothing in here that has to be checked. Sorry, ma'am. Captain's orders. It'll only take a few minutes. Well, I never heard of such a thing. A passenger simply doesn't have any privacy at all. I've traveled on a lot of different lines, but I've seen a wonder if you mind moving over to the other rail. I'd like to look through these lockers. Sure, go ahead. What's the matter? You lost something? No. 
No, just looking things over. Oh, there's nothing in there but life preservers. Yeah, that's right. You must be getting ready to sink the boat. <laughs> Gotta collect the insurance, huh? <laughs> Gotta send this all to the bottom, huh? <laughs> But not one of us could find that deadly shape, coiled in some dark corner or outstretched along a window seat. Not one of us caught a glimpse of that horrid head with its beady, black, watchful eyes. The thing lay waiting out there somewhere along the deck, shaded in the gathering dusk. But where? We didn't know. It was nearly dark when we met together again in the chart room. Well, gentlemen, there's no other way around it. We risk all the time we can. We've got to warn the passengers. Uh, how do we do it, Captain? To call them all together in the lounge? No, if we did anything like that, we'd be asking for a panic. We'll get one, whether we ask for it or not. And uh, we pick a few men and go through the cabin decks. Get them individually, inside the cabin. Watch for any that act like they might cause trouble. We'll keep an eye on them. Handle the crew the same way. Right, Captain. As soon as you're finished, arm all the deck officers and start searching again. Our only chance of preventing a riot is to find that damnable snake. The slow nightmare that followed grew worse by the hour. None of us slept. All the ship's officers not on duty kept on with that endless search. Passengers locked themselves in their cabins or huddled together in the lounges, knowing all the time that no spot on board could be called safe. Fear was a heavy fog in the lungs of all of us, and every light on the vessel burned throughout the night. Morning came, brought no relief. Terror and tension mounted by the hour. There, now, Mrs. Crane, stop getting yourself all worked up and go back to your cabin. The horrid things probably crawled overboard anyway. Oh, you're saying that. You're paid to say that. You don't know. Nobody knows. Now, now, everything's going to be all right. If only we can do something. If all of us could, could only get off the ship, oh, they, they could fumigate it. Yeah, that, that's it. We, we, we've, got to, we've got to get off the ship. We've got to get off wait, the ship. Wait, Mr. Bowman, she's going to jump. Get out of Hurry it up, lady. Nice work, Mr. Bowman. Get her down to her cabin. And whatever you do, don't turn loose. <laughs> Where it might strike you. You can't put on a coat or move a chair without risking your life. Something's got to be done. It might be right here in this lounge. Yeah, yeah all right. You know, better quiet down and take it easy. Take it easy? You're a great officer. Why don't you do something about it? That thing might be crawling around here right under our feet somewhere. I said shut up. Are you trying to start a pen? I got a right to talk. I don't want to die. Nobody's going to tell me what. The second night passed. Morning came round again. A gray and rainy day that dragged past, and then night came down again. Third night of the terror. Again, every light burned, the whole ship seethed in the throes of incipient panic. Faced by a horror they'd never met on the sea before, crew and officers alike were on the verge of revolt. Passengers sat huddled in a trance-like stupor, ready to scream at the slightest unknown sound. Seven bells, I made my way forward to the chart room, found Captain Wood bent over his desk. Oh, hello, Christopher. Come on in. Sit down. It's got to be somewhere, Captain Wood. It's got to be. I don't know. You could search the ship for six months and never touch all the places aboard. If we can only hold out for two more days, we'll be in. What's the home office say? Mm, use the latest wireless from them. Keep quiet and keep coming. <laughs> what else can we do? How is it on the decks? Pretty bad. Anything could happen. Yes, that's why I took the guns away from the men. One pistol shot and we'd have a riot on our hands. The whole thing's my fault, Captain Wood. That's what I can't oh, forget. Uh, there was only some way I could pay for it myself alone. No. I know how you feel. But it's no more your fault than mine, or the man who asked you to bring that snake back alive. Nobody planned this. You'd better try to get a little sleep, boy. Sleep. Mr. Bowman made some coffee down in the steward's galley a while ago. Why don't you go on down and get yourself a cup? Then rest for a couple of hours. Hmm? Rest? I can't rest. Christopher... I can't help anything if you stumble through a hatch half sleep and break your neck, is it? You go and get some coffee. One way or another, we've got to hold out for two more days. Light was on the steward's galley. Coffee pot was standing on the stove. Still warm, so I didn't bother to heat it. Poured out a cup, carried it over and set it on the porcelain tabletop in the center of the room. 
started to light a cigarette. The door of the pan cover beneath the sink standing slightly ajar. I happened to glance toward it. I dropped the cigarette. Moved slowly backward. I'd found the Bushmaster. As I moved, the snake slid out of the cupboard in a single sinuous glide. Drew back into a loose coil on the galley floor, never taking his eyes off me. I moved slowly back, waiting any moment for that deadly slithering strike. How had he known it was me? He'd stayed quiet when Bowman was here. How had he picked the first time in five days that I was without a gun? My hands touched the bulkhead behind me and I stopped. Only then I realized in terror what I'd done. The call button and the door were on the far side of the room. I'd backed into a dead end. I stared at the snake in fascination, expecting any moment the ripping slash of those poison fangs. The horrid coils tightened a little. Then was still again. Ten million years of evolution to produce this moment. Homo sapiens versus Lachesis muta. A man against mute fate. And all the odds were on fate. I knew then that I was going to die. feel the sweat run down between the painted walls and the palms of my hands pressing against it. My skin crawled and twitched and the pit of my stomach was as cold as ice. With no sound but the rush of blood in my ears. The snake shifted again, drawing into a tighter coil, always tighter. Why didn't the devil get it over with? Then, just for an instant, his head veered away. Something moved over by the stove. I didn't dare turn to look at it. Slowly it moved out into my line of vision. It was a cat. That scrawny cat Clara that Mother sneaked aboard in LaGuardia. Its back was arched and every hair stood on end. It moved stiff-legged now, walking in a half circle around the snake. The Bushmaster moved slowly and kept watching the cat. He tightened. He was going to strike at any second. He struck and missed. The cat was barely out of reach. But now she was walking back and forth again. She was asking to die. Missed again, by a fraction of an inch. He was striking now without even going to a full coil. Missed, again and again, always missing by the barest margin. Each time the cat danced barely out of reach, and each time she countered with one precise side of a dainty paw, bracing her skinny frame on three stiff legs. And then suddenly I realized what she was doing. But the Bushmaster was tired. The one strike was just an instant slow, but in that split second, sharp claws raked across the evil head and ripped out both the lidless eyes. The cat had deliberately blinded the snake. He didn't bother to coil now, but slid after her in a fury, striking wildly and rapidly, always missing. And every strike was a little slower than the last one until finally. As the snake's neck stretched out at the end of the strike, the cat made one leap and sank her razor sharp teeth just back of the ugly head. Sank her until they crunched bone. Tooth and claw, she clung as a monstrous like flailed and lashed on the floor, striving to get those hideous claws around her, trying to break her hold, to shake off the claw and certain paralyzing death that gradually crept over him and at last stilled his struggles forever. I took a deep breath. First in minutes. The cat lay on his side on the floor, panting, resting from the fight just over. She had a right to rest. That mangy, brave, beautiful alley cat had just saved my life. And maybe others as well. But as I turned toward the stove, I suddenly became very humble. And I knew all at once what a small thing a human being really is. I and others aboard were still alive only by the merest accident. There were three reasons why that cat had fought and killed the world's deadliest snake. And those three reasons came tottering out from under the stove on shaky little legs. Three kittens with their eyes bright with wonder, their tails stiff as pokers. Up on the decks, hundreds of passengers were waiting for the news that the days and nights of terror were ended. They could wait a little longer. I pulled open the doors of the cabinet, found a can of milk. Then I dropped down on my knees on the floor of the galley. The 
Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. And tonight brought to you a shipment of Mute Fate by Martin Storm. Adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield. Featuring Harry Bartell as Chris Warner, Barry Kroger as Captain Wood, and Peggy Weber as Mother Willis. With Don Diamond, Sarah Selby, and Frank Gerstel. Special effects by David Light. The musical score was conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Next week... You are hanging by your fingertips on the sheer face of an ice cliff, suspended 2,000 feet above instant death, with your strength running out, and with no chance for escape. Next week, escape with C.E. Montague's exciting story, Action. Good night, then, until the same time next week when CBS again offers you Escape. <laughs>